All right, we're on. We're recording now. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Jamie, Jamie. <laughs> All right. Distributed journalism, collective intelligence. So uh, today we're going to focus on a fair bit of Doug's research. So this is the stuff that Doug has been diving into over how long? What's how long have you been working on this? <laughs> probably not. <laughs> you probably don't want to say. For years. I've been doing this as the fourth year of my PhD now. Yeah. And then the year before that was my honours year. So that was kind of the introduction. Of all you did it in honours as well, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Like, this is like the kind of heavy duty stuff. Um, so yeah, about four years, I'd say. Yeah. So this is heavy duty stuff. So we'll think, um, and it be, we can put our trigger warning up front. Yeah, I think we'll so. do that again, Probably and we'll say idea. that we might be showing some stuff that might be upsetting. Yeah, we'll see how we go. Uh, tabs we'll see. <laughs> we'll see how we go. Yes, we will. <laughs> <laughs> um, it can be it can be upsetting in a couple of ways. Yeah, um, there's I guess there's kind of like the graphic content angle, which is always um, unpleasant. Mm. Then you've also got the kind of the upsetting in the fact that there's really some stuff here that. Um, can kind of shake up your perception of what's real and what's not. Yeah. Yeah. So it can kind of be um, it's confrontational in that respect, I guess. Yeah. Well, I was thinking in uh, in these terms. So we we have this this setup, and we can come back to this. This is what I was thinking of. Ah, yes, the old profession in crisis. Eh? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So you've presented this before, <laughs> and it's been kind of interesting. Yeah, it gets um, a very mixed response. <laughs> it gets a mixed response and uh, it was kind of like, it ended in a ref stoppage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Time out. Time <laughs> yeah. Out. This has to end. <laughs> this yeah, has to end. Yeah. yeah. So exactly. what you've, you've noticed and what you've been following is, so we, we have this sort of scene and this yeah. really depicts what's going on yeah. and the circles that we see, the red circles. Yep. Uh, what is causing this? Yes, yeah, exactly. So those, everything that's circled there, as you can tell, is, uh, they're all kind of cameras, yeah? Yeah. So it's like, and obviously, it's just kind of citizens holding these cameras. It's kind of a totally different dynamic. Um, and see how many of them are. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine, nine individual cameras. So you've got nine kind of reporters on the scene. Well, yeah. Totally engaged, totally so, embedded. Yeah. So all of these are capture devices, mm. and when we combine that with the internet, yeah. we've got this distributed journalism effect, yes. where all of these people can be recording what's happening and then uploading it to the internet, yes. and really nothing is going to stop them. No, not at all. Um, nothing, in fact. No. Um, there's no game Unless you take away their internet. Yeah, yeah. That's which true. we saw last week. Yes. Um, and there'll still workarounds for that anyway. So and there's still workarounds. Yeah. There's always there's always a way to kind of get information out. Yeah. Regardless of what kind of restrictions have been put on the channels, I guess. Yeah, and we're seeing this we're seeing this uh, expand even more as bandwidth expands as well. Yes. So like ten years ago, this would have been harder. Yeah. Because you would have had a dial up connection. Yep. To try and upload all this stuff. Yeah. So it would have been small footage yeah really pixel i mean you've seen really smartphone pixelated. footage from like yeah. say 10 years ago and it's just like 20 pixels on the screen and so yeah I'm yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no all those videos style. that used to circulate via email oh and like your friends are texting to you at school and stuff yeah like, yeah <laughs> up, like, yeah but now you can record this in hd you can live mm -hmm. stream it mm -hmm. which is really interesting and yeah. the live streaming has a particular effect because it's just all out there yes yeah exactly. it's all happening yep. it's not being edited no there's no it's just um there's no copy raw, room there's totally no raw. editor there's no none of and this if stuff multiple people are live streaming simultaneously then you have like totally different kind of perspective on the events yeah 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 and then especially when the live streams are saved to say youtube or another hosting platform afterwards like yeah they can be deconstructed by everyone yeah after the event yeah so i'll go through some stuff and we're going to kind of look yeah. at this topic. Yeah, let's have a look at it. This is and good stuff. yeah, I will set up some of the the kind of conceptual stuff. Yep. I'll try and move through that as quickly as I can, and then we can get into Doug's stuff. Yeah, that there's good. a lot of material. So much. Previously, <laughs> you've only had 
like right. 20 minutes yeah and then they got because of the to uh, present this stuff and sometimes it got it gets got, reduced got on the cut. day yeah they don't want to hear me talk. yeah 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 but now <laughs> now you can go as oh. long as you want yeah we got all the time in the world so we've got all the time in the world we don't know how long this is going to go for no, now no, no idea Maybe um we'll see what happens yeah we'll see what happens when people are watching this back yeah and they go why is it four hours <laughs> Which is only good for two hours. <laughs> yeah. 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 So we'll see how we go. I don't think it's going to go that long, but. No, you never know. We never know. It's a big rabbit hole, that's for sure. So we have this, and this is the thing that we've been talking about for a few weeks now. We've seen this in a couple of different versions the one to many and this movement of many to many. And we think of this in journalism terms, where you've got all these informational inputs. Because informational inputs is a, that's the important way to kind of think of yeah, it. Yeah, because it, it doesn't just have to be video footage. It no. can be data. Yeah. Like we saw that last week with the, the um, in Japan, the yeah. radioactive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It's not just um, kind of visual or auditory footage or anything yeah. like that. Yeah, So you can have this many-to-many -many thing. Yep. where there can be people capturing video, capturing audio, capturing data, yep. all of this stuff, and they're all just sharing it. Yep. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly. not like this one person or this one entity. No, not at all. Because we can think of these things as entities as well, Yes. like we were sort of discussing. Yep. Well, do these have to be people? Yeah, exactly. They can be, I mean, they can be devices as well. Yeah. It's not just people. Yeah, or organizations, yeah. brands. Yep. yep. And that's, that's where we're going to get to today. Everything exists on the same plane. It's yeah. Interesting. It's all equal. It's all equal. So when we're thinking of legacy media, and we've been through this, we've got high cost of entry, high risk, and there's this filter over everything. Yeah. And purified. Well, it, yeah, it can be purified. It to be. It's purified in some sense. Yeah, yeah. F yeah, filter's a good way to put it, I think. It's always filtered, mm. and it's purified in some sense for a particular framing. Yes, yes, exactly. Gatekeepers, <laughs> and this is the filtering mechanism. These are the people who do the filtering. So if you've got, I mean, we've got the editorial rooms, broadcasters, distributors, and the printers. Yeah. So I think I've spoken in my tutorials a fair bit about how we have, um, like when you think about it, you've got this event, right? Mm. This thing happens and then this reporter is the one person who goes and like objectively looks over this event, but then that information goes back into the the newsroom and then that goes through say yeah. know, five to ten different people before yeah, exactly. it gets put out. Yeah. So it's like before you know, anyone sees this yeah, stuff. Yeah. A lot of people have a say in the shaping of how that information gets from event to yeah. broadcast. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So if we think about that first picture mm -hmm. that we showed. Yeah, it's definitely all that camera footage yeah. enters an editorial room yeah. and it's sorted through and yeah. figured out. And chopped together in a nice kind of chopped together to and packaged. Yeah. And packaged is the really important thing. Yes. And that's a lot of totally closed process too. Like obviously the only people who see that are the people in the in yeah. newsroom. Yeah. So I think that this covers that really well. The yeah. the authority thing is really important here. Yes. Because yes. that's what we see. This is one component of many components <laughs> of journalism in crisis. Yes. Is this move from the journalist or the news source as the authority of information? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, they've kind of got this like, kind of aura of mystique, I guess. Yeah. Um, due to the fact that they're the ones who are there doing the reporting. Mm. So when you take that away and when anyone can do it, it's kind of like totally flattens it out. It's yeah. a level playing field. I yeah, guess. it's a level playing field. <coughs> and if we move forward here, so this is interesting. All, <laughs> I love all the news that's fit to print. This is great. Yeah, so, <laughs> so this is their slogan. This is their slogan. And it's really interesting because it captures a lot. Yes. It captures it what we're talking about yeah. in the sense of, well, th there's this interesting dynamic, right, where the six o'clock news, mm. let's say, for example, is typically a fixed time period, isn't it? Yeah. Half, Half an hour or an maybe, hour. An maybe an hour. Yeah, depending, depending on your channel. Depending on your channel. It's whatever. pretty repetitive. It's serialized. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... It's all the news that can fit in that time period, isn't yeah. it? 
Yeah, exactly. I yeah. Mean, you can't have, you can't run over time because like you've got yeah, exactly. things that are kind of afterwards. So you've got to really condense down yeah. your show. So you've got to package it into yeah. this thing. Yeah, exactly. It's interesting. It maps to the same idea, the same concept as what we talk about with the length of music. Yeah, yeah, it's like the um, yeah. So the, the example about, like, records yeah. and stuff like so you've got the record and that's called a single because you can only fit one single track on the side of a forty-five, right? Yeah, and that's why most pop songs are between up to five minutes because that's the maximum number of time you can have. Yeah, that's what you can on fit on that. Yeah. yeah, so all these these singles that get shipped out to all the radio stations, yeah. they had a max time on them yep. that was imposed by the medium. Yeah, yeah. So the medium is the message, right? Yeah. Straight up. Yeah. So what's really interesting now is when you have digital yes. and you don't need a time limit on no, stuff. No, like not. this, we could keep recording oh, yeah, for hours. Just, like, for, days. for hours and hours. <laughs> and it, w it wouldn't, to the medium, it makes no difference. No, no, it's almost limitless really. Yeah, yeah. We're not producing this for a time slot no. on, on no, TV. No, I mean, if you think about YouTube channels that you would watch, uh, where you kind of watch a lot of their content. Mm. Um, some of their videos will go from five minutes maybe up to 20, 25 minutes, half an hour. Yeah. Depending on what they're talking about, what the content is. Yeah. There's no, it's not as if every single episode goes for 10 minutes exactly and that's it. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Nothing like that. Yeah. It's just so if you listen to a, a podcast, like think if you've got a regular podcast that you listen to. Yeah. Like I think of the ones that I regularly listen to. Yeah. And they could run from anywhere from say 45, 50 minutes to an hour and a half, two hours. Yeah. There's some that could run four hours. Yeah. There's some that could run six hours. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And it really on depends on... The content, how much the time they've got to talk about. How much about time they've got to talk about stuff. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, and the content and how much needs to be covered and everything. So you're not, you're not dealing with these fixed slots. No. And when we're talking about the New York Times, a printed medium. Yes. The length of that story, a word count, doesn't matter yeah, as exactly. much in a digital context. No, not at all. The feedback mechanism is different yes. in the word length yes. because you s can start to get, well, you start to get into the power of digital stuff yes. because you can start to use that to optimize content for your readership yes. because you know that, say, because you've got all your tracking mechanisms set up on your articles, yes. you know that people only typically read, say, 600 words. Yeah, 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 exactly. Or 1,200 words or whatever. And that can depend on your audience. Yes. Like, I've, I listen to a six-hour podcast, and that's because I will listen to that. But I'm guessing a lot of people... <laughs> they don't want to spend six hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then they find content that fits what they want to listen to. Yeah. But I can also listen to that six-hour podcast over a week. Yes, that's true as well. It's not as if... And it's like, think about television where something's it's on channel 10 for this time period on this day. Yeah. And you have to sit there and that's when you yeah. are engaged. Like yeah. You can come back to things, you can listen to half of something, you can, you can do whatever you want when it's online. You can yeah, tap exactly. back in and out yeah. in your own terms. Yeah, time works differently. Yes. It's not linear. No, no. All the similarities, hey, to the uh, yeah. industrial... Yeah, I know. It's interesting. Yeah, because think of it, the TV... Yeah. TV lineups, the TV yeah. program is a sequence. Yes, yeah, exactly. And the news is a sequence. What's the typical format of the six o'clock news? <laughs> the introduction comes in, then there's um, breaking news, and then there's some stuff, and then there's sport, and then there's weather. Yeah. And then there's always some kind of feel good story at the end. Yeah, so like, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Good. You're like, oh, that wasn't a total depressing experience. Yeah, there's a sequence there. Yeah, there is. But when you're dealing online, there's no sequence. No, not at all. Because it's not packaged as a finalized product. No, it kind of is always ongoing. It just sits there. Yep. So as usual. <laughs> 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 so we package the news for you in a bundle, so we've talked about that. Yep. And that's the fit to print. Yep. So this is the what we're gonna talk about a little bit is the business stuff. Yeah, I think that's important. It is. It's super important mm. because it's important because it's let's not focus on journalism as bad guys. Yeah, no, not at all. I mean, they're kind of just a product of the yeah. medium, really. They're not bad guys. No. It's the affordances 
yes. of the medium, yes, exactly. it makes them work a particular way. Yeah. And the yeah, business exactly. models have to be a particular way. Yeah. And the reason why journalism is in crisis <coughs> is because the business model doesn't fit the medium anymore. No, no, it doesn't. So that's, yeah, exactly. So that's where the problem is coming from. Yeah. It's not because they're bad guys. It's because we've got this situation where the business models don't work anymore. Yep. So how do you move forward from there? Yeah, how do you adapt? So this is kind of the, the idea. Like if you're, doing, if you're doing advertising stuff, you are, you're thinking of it in terms of you get an advertiser or you get a sponsor or whatever, and then you know that that'll pay for a certain chunk of your operations. Yep. So you can say, okay, we've got Walmart on board. Walmart is giving us this much money yep. to do this much stuff. Yep. And we can say that they're paying for the Baghdad Bureau. Yep. There you go. Yep, straight up. And that's how it works, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, it is. Like think of the stuff that we've done where we're raising money or trying to raise money. Yep. And you map it to this. Yeah, you do, absolutely. And all the advertisements you see kind of in your newspaper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Adverts on the telly. Yeah. They're all paying for the upkeep of the, yeah. the channel, really. Yeah, they're all, they're all paying for the upkeep of the channel. And keeping it going. Yeah. So you buy it from us because you trust us. So this is really <laughs> interesting. That's, yeah, okay. That is interesting, isn't it? The yeah. The idea of trust and the idea of going back to the New York Times where they say what's fit to print. Like yeah. What is fit to print? Who, who gets to decide what's fit to kind of... Well, who are your advertisers? Who are your sponsors? Yeah, yeah. Like Who's giving you money? So you've kind of got this oh, like really interesting um, dynamic between information about things happening in the world and then you've got all these ties to the people who are literally paying your salary and keeping you afloat as a company and you have to balance like the way that you talk about things in the real world so that it's in the not in the interests but it yeah. maybe doesn't conflict necessarily with your um, advertisers who are literally paying you yeah to stay to stay afloat yeah so there's a kind of an interesting dynamic there so advertising income is a typo there <laughs> advertising income fallen off a cliff it's not coming back it's not coming back no. um yeah i think obviously as the internet kind of gets bigger bigger more people are spending more time online they're realizing that advertisers are realizing that spending money kind of in the legacy journalism paradigm isn't necessarily getting them the return that it would have been yeah so um, I've been talking about this with in the tutorials. It's interesting. One of the really important things with this is the tracking mechanisms. Mm. Because with digital, you can track everything. Yes. So if you're an advertiser, you can get really good feedback. Oh, more than you'd ever get before. Yeah. Like pinpoint kind of Yeah, accuracy. pinpoint stuff. Like yeah. you know exactly yeah. when people are listening to your Where podcast people are clicking what people are doing yeah you know exactly how long they're spending on your yep. website yeah or exactly what second they're turning off your youtube video yep. all of that stuff yep. yeah exactly. and then when you've got stuff like facebook and google plugged into it mm. you can get weirdly detailed mm. analytics on yeah, these on can, the people you? it kind of gives you a really kind of awkwardly holistic picture of the whole situation yeah and you like when compare that to when you'd be putting information or adver advertisements out on say the evening like during the evening news or something like you have no idea really if it works or not like yeah you, you might have a bit of an idea like your sales might go up a few percent yeah it was like some people might say in the feedback oh yeah i saw you on the telly but like you don't know what about the advertisement resonated with them you can't see where they tapped in tapped out yeah all that kind of stuff you can't see their click history how they got to you yeah anything like that yeah so this like the internet with this kind of new dynamic gives you a much more detailed profile of your audience. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. And even something like this. So like, let's have a look at this actually. We can play with this. So um, if I add in here. So, so let's just think about this in terms of the medium as well. Yep. So I have 
put this out there, right? And yeah. I'm working off this. Yep. So I can go in here now. Yeah, you can. And it. I can fix that typo. Yep. And that's why all the news that's fit to print mm. is really interesting. Because when it goes to print, it's not coming back. No, it's, uh, it's staying there. Yeah. And yeah. the only time that anything ever would be picked up is kind of in some little editorial note, maybe. Yeah. In the side that they really didn't read anyway. Yeah, yeah. It's totally different. So when it goes to print, like it's, and this is the package thing, yeah. you have to finalize it. That's your, your product. It's yeah, like yeah, yeah. It's like you've got a box with a bow on top and then you yeah. give that Yeah, and away. you have to ship it. Yep, exactly. As is. Literally ship it in the back of the. So you've got all these people who are like it. perfectionists yeah, about yeah. stuff yeah. because yeah. they have to get everything just right. Yep. Where in this medium, you don't have to get everything just right no. the first time. No, not at all. No. you can, just, you can edit on the fly. You can edit on the fly, like yeah. I just did. Yeah, exactly. So... That typo wasn't uh, on purpose either, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no, that, that could have been staged, yeah. nicely staged, but it wasn't. <laughs> so if we get back to here, and I'll remove Prezi. And we'll get back into where we are. So that will sync over. Yep. So that'll be fine. So the internet is the most efficient medium at matching demand and supply. Yes. And I think I think your case studies will talk to that. Yeah. Really nicely. Will. Absolutely. Because you've got these feedback mechanisms in place. Yes. Right, where and we'll see it in your stuff yes. where information and things are put out there and you can certainly get a sense of the sort of information that people are looking for. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if it's not kind of what people want, it just gets rejected. No views, no engagement with the content and then you move on, right? Yeah, yeah. So you kind of, it's like what we're talking about with artifacts and everything like that where you look for the content that gets most engagement and then you can make more of that because mm. that's what your audience obviously wants. So, so Mark Scott from the ABC. <laughs> this is telling, isn't it? Yeah. So, okay, so it would be wonderful to present you with some vibrant future of the old media organisations, but for newspapers in particular, the last great hope is what, waiting for Rupert to come by you. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. The Murdoch machine, man. Yeah, yeah. But why are they doing that? Why are they waiting? They've got no other option. Well, I mean, it's a, kind of a death. Yeah, it's this is it. Yeah, to survive, exactly. they have to stop the audience from acting as a publisher. Yes, exactly. Because if the audience wants the news, they can just go get the news now yes. from all the other sources, not just these yeah. journalistic... It's really interesting you mentioned this, actually. I saw a video put out by the ABC the other day um, it was the whole, the whole point of it was after some kind of trolling debacle on this thing called ABC Me. Um, but this is quite interesting because the way that the ABC, obviously being a legacy organisation, framed users on the internet, they framed the users who were engaging with content and publishing their own things and commenting as kind of evil and bad. Well, that's what they have to do. Yeah, yeah. That's what you have to do. And they that's the only way the, to survive. The other people who just passively engage, maybe like something. They frame them as like the good guys. Like, the good guys. We want more of you because you just consume. You don't publish your own stuff and you're feeding back into our system, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, these people are problems. Mm. So <laughs> much so that here he is, the man himself. Uh, <laughs> what more do you need to say? Hey? Yeah. So see, the key words <laughs> there are free, open, uncontrollable internet. Yep. Yes, versus shackled newspapers. Yeah. Shackled, yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. He knows, he knows, straight yeah, up. Yeah, of course he knows. He's not an idiot. Yeah. Do you think he's Rupert Murdoch because he's an idiot? No. <laughs> <laughs> not even for a second. <laughs> <laughs> this is the point. This is the point. So what, <clears throat> what do they have to stand on? What does journalism, what do journalists have to stand on? And it's not that they are evil people again. No, no, not at all. It's just a. It's that the playing field has been leveled, mm. and they 
are now one of many yes. who can contribute I guess content. The, the idea of something that's interesting kind of here, but I'm talking about legs to stand on, something that kind of constantly gets brought up is the idea of integrity, I think. Yeah. Like journalistic integrity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I think is um, it's quite interesting. That's an interesting argument. We'll look into that further on. Yeah. So this is from the editor of The Guardian. And he is better than Mark Scott from the ABC. <laughs> Because he actually hits yeah. the problem, yes. open versus closed. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Packaged versus un, versus just free, stuff that's just range. sitting there. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's just sitting there. You cannot control distribution or create scarcity. And scarcity is the other really interesting thing. Mm. When we talk about demand and supply. Yes. Because remember we said the internet is a copy machine. Yes. We keep saying that. Yes. There's no scarcity here. No, not at all. Um, if it exists in one place, it can exist everywhere. Yeah. And to do so is very easy. Yeah. The thing is that it's easy to create media now. Mm. And it's easy to create information or whatever, however you want to put it. Yeah. The, um, I think it's the old editor of Wyatt calls that the democratization of the tools of production. Yeah. So it's like everyone can produce and create now. Yeah. I mean, you have a phone and you can literally do anything. But what does that mean for business models? Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> there's no scarcity. No. And that, that's where price comes from. Yes. Exactly. Something that is expensive. Yes. Is because it's there's scarce. a limited amount of them, the scarcity, <clears throat> yes. and people want it. Exactly. So that's what drives the price up. Yeah. And that's kind of why the, I don't know if we've touched on this before, but the, the value now comes from rather the value being placed on content, the value is more placed on audience attention. Yeah. So it's the attention economy. It's the attention economy. Because that's what you're doing. There's literally a absolute kind of flood of content. Mm. And it's like, how do you make content that will grab the attention of the audience? Yeah. How do you do that? Yeah. Yeah, because that's... Because they get to what, choose now. They get to choose yeah. what they want to engage with. They so. can choose whatever they want. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you're dealing with grabbing their attention. Yep. And this is what we're dealing with, the closed content model, the open content model. Because it's not just consumption attention, it's production attention yes. as well. Yeah, exactly. Where are people creating content as well as consuming it? Yeah. So open access platform, free content, generative value... And values participation. This is what the internet does. Yes. So the stuff there over on the right. Yes. This is the internet. And the other side there, that's the old model. Yes, the legacy paradigm. Yeah, paid content, artificial scarcity. Yep. And control of distribution. Yeah. And participation's addictive. Like, yeah. People like to kind of, once you start making things, you get a taste for when you see an audience kind of. Um, giving you feedback on your content and like enjoying stuff that you're making you want to make more right yeah especially with social media yeah, stuff yeah, yeah, exactly. where the interfaces are designed yes. to trigger dopamine yes, responses exactly, exactly. in your brain exactly. so so you make you're making content yep. and you're putting it on social media yep. and then you're getting the same response that you get from a poker machine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like you upload, say, an aesthetic photo to Instagram and you get like, oh, that one got 100 likes, I'm gonna do more of that. Yeah, because it's more the same more thing. More. Exactly. It's the like, same thing. You just, you keep creating content. Yeah. So he goes on, and this is a really good piece to read, mm. by the way, the URL's yeah, there. Highly recommended. Um, authority versus involvement, and that's what we're talking about here. So readers want to have the ability to make their own judgments, express their own priorities, create their own content, articulate their own views, and learn from peers as much as from traditional sources of authority. Mm, that's very interesting, isn't it? Actually? Yeah. And this is in 2010. Yeah. Eight years ago now. Yeah. Mm. That was a long time ago. Mm, a lot's changed since a, then. Well, well I mean, it's kind awareness of, yeah, of this has changed. Because yes, right the same thing was happening. Yeah. The same thing was happening there. So the authority model versus the involvement model. Mm. Content as a product versus content as conversation. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. I think that's yeah, that's a good way I mean, that's a good way of thinking about it if you even consider the dynamic of 
even when a legacy source posts something on, say, Facebook, like the ABC or the Guardian or whatever, there's now at least there's a space underneath where it can be deconstructed. In you the can turn those comments off. Yeah, you look can. at a lot of sources; they turn yeah, the comments they do, off. Yeah, they do. That's interesting. I've noticed that quite yeah. often when there's material that is um, kind of intense or is going to provoke a lot of debate. They just can it. Yeah, we get too many hate comments. Yeah, yeah. It's always, <laughs> that's always a great go-to, isn't it? And then you can't see the hate comments because they're disabled now. And you're like, oh, well, I guess there must have been hate comments. Who knows? Yeah. Maybe that's not with people engaging with that, that kind of content. Yeah. Mm. So content is conversation, dynamic, open access, decentralized. Yes. So back to our quote from Jay <coughs> Rosen. Oh, excellent. <laughs> We've seen this a few times oh, now. Haven't we? The people formerly known as the audience. Listened in isolation from one another. Mm. They certainly don't do that anymore, do they? No. No. I mean you can find someone on the other side of the world who's interested in the very niche topic you are and you're not isolated. You can work together. Yeah. Talk to them. Yeah. Create content together. Yeah. So if we think of things in terms of our network topologies. Yes. And you're gonna talk about this a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, I will touch on especially number C there distributed yeah yeah so a shift so this is Axel Bruns yep from Perth a shift from dedicated individuals and teams as producers to a broader base distributed generation of content by a wide community of participants this is really interesting because this text captures it so well mm. The text is so good that it's almost boring. Yeah. <laughs> Be because it seems so obvious. Yes. When you read it. Yes. It makes so much sense. Yeah. I mean, if you only take a second to think about your habits. Yeah. In an online space. You only like, take a yeah. Exactly what I do. Take a take a second to step back from your own habits and yeah. the habits of your friends. Yes. And all of this stuff, and and have a look and deconstruct that then this text becomes boring yeah. because it's so obvious. Yeah, exactly. But that's what's so valuable about this text. Because it's literally highlighting yeah. the most, one of the most important aspects of the new kind of paradigm that we're yeah. creating media in, I guess. Yeah. Ranging from professional to amateur. Yes. That's what we mean when we say flattened. I mean, everyone, it's all the same now. Yeah. You might, I mean, yeah, you guys all have a, you might have a degree in media, but then someone who's, never had a university education still has the same tools and the power to create stuff well i know plenty of people who have degrees yeah, in all sorts of exactly, things yeah. and they are very good media yes, makers exactly and that's the point engineering really? students yep. computer science students yep. who are top tier media makers yep and i mean think about how easy it is just to google stuff online if you don't know how to do something in a media sense you can google it and then you can figure out the answer yeah so it's just that easy Artifacts generated are no longer products in a traditional sense. And that's what we're talking about with the package stuff. And we'll see this with collective intelligence, how things just get put out there and then pulled apart. Yes. Enabling continuing collaboration. So what's really interesting about that is something can be made and then it can just sit there mm. for a long time. Yep. Sometimes it can sit there years yep. before it gets reused. Yes, and nothing happens to it. Yeah, nothing happens there. to it. Think about all the stuff that happens in politics yes. now. Yes. The dirt <laughs> on people that's oh. pulled up. Yes. Yeah, getting dirt on someone's a lot easier now because there's so much content that just sits there. Well, there's there. so much content, but it sits there forever. Yeah, and it just <sighs> exists. Yeah, it just exists. So at any stage, you can, any person, not just some media organization, but any person can go back yep. and pull out something about a politician and try to frame it and put it online. Yeah. So something that happened 10 years ago, completely insignificant at the time. Yep, yep, yep. exactly. Can be spun, yeah. I guess is the word, spun yeah. or reframed yeah. to suit a um, particular kind of story or agenda or yeah. ongoing narrative. I yeah, guess. because something can happen and it has no resonance. Yes. It just, yeah, exactly. But then 10 years later it does. Yes. Why is that? Yeah, exactly. Things kind of come and go in that respect. So always unfinished and content. Mm, that's really important as well. The fact that it's always unfinished. Yeah. 
So the entire process is open and can be entered at any point. Yes, production, aggregation, curation. Yeah, so we see this in distributed journalism. We'll see this in meme warfare as well. Yep. You can contribute anything. Yep. If you have some particular skill, yep. you're very good at writing slogans. Yes. You can just jump in there and write the slogan yep. and be done with it and get yeah, out. And you leave. And, and you that, leave, yeah. And that's your input. And that's your input. Or you can hang around for the whole thing yep. if you really want yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, of course. If you've got the time. Yeah. And I mean, say some people might be better at kind of curating a certain aesthetic for different pieces of information. They're not good at producing as such. But hmm. They're good at compiling different things together. Yeah. And then they come yeah, yeah, in yeah. halfway through and they're like, they've got slogan guys, um, slogans. <laughs> yeah, like, slogan guy. <laughs> and they're like... <laughs> Put slogan guys, slogans together with some um, some images that they've also found, and they're curating this information, yeah. and aggregating it together, rather than producing like they're pulling. It's like their assemblage of pieces of information is what makes them valuable. Mm. Yeah. So let's jump into your stuff. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. So um, this is a presentation that I did for a conference last year, I think, with a few tweaks. Um, there's some really, some good stuff in here, actually. It's quite interesting. Um, so we're kind of going to explore some of the dynamics of how information flows online. I guess um, I say this a lot, but it's probably important to mention again, like these mechanics can exist basically in any context. Um, the one that I've used at the moment is, because um, like obviously my PhD is on conflict journalism, so conflict is kind of the frame setter, I guess. Mm. But the mechanics that uh, run underneath this are pretty much applicable to any any topic or anything online. Yeah, we see this in heaps of stuff. Yep. Um, so there are a few there are a few different things that's kind of at play here. So we've got the idea of having um, different modes of media production. We've got. Uh, cognitive surplus this is a really interesting thing. So it's the constructive use of free time for community projects. Mm. Um, and I think this is probably, it's like almost the, the key driver of why um, online content is so much of it and why it's kind of so interesting and it's so diverse. Mm. Rather than using your cognitive time to kind of just sit and watch TV and consume, you can now use that cognitive time to, to create as well. Um, the roles played by mediators, so mediators are people who are engaging with content at any level. Uh, it doesn't have to be a person, like we said earlier. It can be a device, um, it can be the data itself. Everything yeah. kind of exists on this flat plane. And then, obviously, at the end, collective intelligence. Um, so this is a little case study, I guess. Uh, it's quite interesting. So there was a Bulgarian journal journalist called uh, Diliano, I think it's Getanjevev, I'm pretty sure. Um, now, she worked for a publication called Trud, um, and she published this, which was <laughs> quite interesting. So basically, uh, to give you some context here, we're talking about diplomatic flights carrying weapons for the war in Syria. However, they're not getting carried to the, I guess, if you want to use the term, good guys. Um, so these are basically di diplomatic flights shipping weapons to terrorists, essentially. She did a lot of research in this. I've got some footage that she shot, and we can kind of have a look at that in a second. Yeah. So she published this on, um, on TRUD, which is this kind of the publication that she was employed by. So they paid her salary, I guess you could say. Mm. <laughs> um, here's some footage. I'll see if I can skip through some of the interesting stuff here. There's not really a need for trigger warnings here, it's just kind of, they're just testing some of the stuff that they've bought. So, this is her. Yep, on the left there. And this is where it gets in here. These things are kind of held underground. So you can see here they're kind of going into a basement, and here we have boxes of missiles. Um, we've got boxes of everything, grenades, machine guns, the whole, the whole works. So look at that, I mean there's hundreds of boxes here, see look at this, rockets um, from Bulgaria. From Bulgaria? Piece. Yeah, so rockets coming from Bulgaria 
getting shipped into Syria on diplomatic flights. On diplomatic flights. Diplomatic flights to terrorists. So that's kind of, that's the frame setter, right? This is, this is, this is, this <laughs> the is frame destroyer. Yeah. So this is what's going on. Um, and there's hundreds of them. Have a look at this. They're everywhere. Um, not seeing what about We've got some grenades in here. Oh yeah, we've got some nice rockets and all that kind of thing. Anyway, moving on. Oh no, that always happens. <coughs> How do I? Okay. So these are so that was the footage. Um, and now we have going back, sorry. Um, we have slips that come from these are um, Oh, I guess the closest thing you could think of them are. They're kind of like custom slips. <laughs> um, and this is kind of a, they're, they're diplomatic clearances for what's kind of being transported in these planes. So we've got um, transportation up to 90 tons of military cargo from Bulgaria to Prince Sultan in Saudi Arabia. That's very interesting. Uh-oh. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, look at that. That's... That uh, really breaks down all the narratives, doesn't it? <laughs> then we've got this one, military cargo to Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia as well, and I'm assuming this is coming from... Ministry of Defense. Yeah. Coming from... The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Bulgaria's national arsenal. So it's definitely state sanctioned. So this is going to terrorists. Yeah, it's going to the, the kind of the extreme Saudi terrorists who are then filtering into Syria. That's the basically the gist of what she was. But I thought the Saudis were. Who were the Saudis supposed to be friends with? I don't know, man. <laughs> it's that much of a complete. Well, that's hey, I guess like depending on who you listen to, the Saudis are supposed to be like pretty chummy with the U.S. That's what I thought. Yeah, but then this is a bit. So different, why is this isn't? happening? I don't know. I have no idea. It answers. Asks more questions than it answers. So yeah, here we go. We've got a shipping thing. 790, 790 boxes of grenades and rifles. 790. That's insane. Going into, as you can see, Bulgaria, Saudi Arabia. 6th of October, 2016. So this has been happening for a while. It's not just a one-off one thing. Off. And here we have, so Diliana put this on Twitter. Um, you can literally see bombs, these things here, where there's three of them in a row are bombs getting put on a Silkway flight. This is in Italy, actually, so it's not just Bulgaria who's a part of this. Getting shipped onto a, uh, a Silkway diplomatic flight in Italy. That's interesting, isn't it? Yes. That's um, pretty unexpected. Anyway. It's... <laughs> I don't know what it does. Really. <laughs> <laughs> it's... Oh dear. <laughs> um, well, there's a narrative here. Yeah, there is. There is. There's also lots of counter narratives as well. But the narrative is problematic. It is. Um, because it doesn't sit, does it? It's kind of different. No, well, you've got this ISIS terrorists are bad guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and everyone, everyone hates ISIS, supposedly. Everyone's united in the fight. That seems to be the... The narrative seems to be that everyone's united in the fight against ISIS, correct? Like... Yeah. Like, it's... They're the, the, the folk devil of Western society. And then, how come... How come these countries are... Hmm. Helping them... Helping them along? Um, so, anyway, she published this, right? And this is really interesting. So, she just got fired for telling the truth about weapons supplies for terrorists in Syria on diplomatic flights. So she got sacked. She published this. There was a lot of online conversation around it because it, for the very fact that it's kind of uh, interesting and throws a bit of a spanner in the works, you could say. And she got sacked. Um, so this shouldn't have really got past the editor. No. Someone in the editorial team really uh, blew it, <laughs> you could say. <laughs> um, <laughs> terrible um that's yeah. all right we can edit it out yeah excellent so yeah. someone someone really didn't think that through when they were putting that into print um they probably thought it was a bit of a think piece bit of a 
should spend a lot of time on it. Let's publish it out and see how it goes. Mm. Um, so what's interesting though, so she gets sacked, right? So she can't obviously publish any of her information in Trud anymore because she doesn't work there. Yep. However, she still has Twitter, so yeah. she can just keep on going. <laughs> and this was, this was a couple of days after she got the chop and <laughs> weapons continue to flow to terrorists um, from Israel, Germany and Slovakia and they're only visible on military radars. So even though she's got sacked from her place of employment... It in, makes no difference. No, it doesn't. She can still publish yeah. online. There's a million other places she can go to publish this stuff. Yeah. So you've got that distribution thing where, yes. yeah, exactly. where previously she would have got sacked from whatever and would have had to go find a new job to find a new outlet yes. to be able to put her yes, stuff out exactly, there. Yes, exactly, exactly. But instead of having to go and kind of beg the Guardian for a job, she can now just publish her stuff on Twitter and still get good engagement too. Yeah. Um, but it, what's interesting is if she gets sacked for doing this, she ends up getting more engagement. Yes, exactly, because they're like, why did she get sacked? What's going on here? People just kind of dig into it further and further and further and it, like, again, asks more questions than it answers. Yeah. Um, so everything that happened kind of here is in the, this is like an example of the, the legacy paradigm of, of reporting, I guess. Mm. Um, this is your classic kind of journalism incident where something's off brand through publication and you get the chop. Yeah. So I would kind of argue that we're moving into this world of uh, much more adaptive content creation, actually. Adaptive? Um, yeah, where we have people who can like adapt more to kind of the interneted environment they engage more with the um they engaging more with kind of online sources they're pulling things apart it's like that production aggregation curation kind of triangle yeah um and in order to be adapted the content creation process kind of needs to inherit the logic of the medium so that's basically what we've been speaking about for the last few weeks hmm. so this is interesting so here we have um, a number of conflict maps. I've spoken about this previously. Um, notice how there are a few things that are interesting about this. Uh, first of all, there's three totally different formats made by three totally different random online interneted users who are pulling kind of raw data apart and plotting. This is, oh, these maps, just to give you some context, these maps are showing um, the troop movements and basically the territory gains and losses in Syria in excruciating detail. Hmm. Um, this one's kind of interactive, so you can actually click on the pins and it comes up with descriptions about uh, what's happening where. So the black, the black regions you see here is ISIS control. Um, it's quite interesting. And then <clears throat> this, is a, this is a map that's looking at the, the fighting that was taking place in Mosul at the time. This was from uh, the end of August last year. And then this one is by a user called Peter Luchum, who is one of the kind of considered authorities, I guess, when it comes to making this kind of content. Um, you can kind of see here's the different flags, it's like ISIS is pretty well surrounded here and it's not looking good for them at all. So you have this online network of users who really have total freedom in what they create, I guess. They tap into this kind of river of content about the Syrian war. Um, they produce things, they aggregate, they curate, they post things to their own Twitter feeds, they make, they make these kind of maps. Um, they all have different roles kind of within the, within the network, I guess. Mm. So they're citizen aggregators. So this is interesting. So Ivan Sidorenko in particular is one of the key content aggregators for the Syrian war online. Um, a lot of uh, soldiers who are out on the front from the Syrian army will, um, <laughs> it's kind of crazy. They'll literally straight up slide into his DMs and message him on Twitter, um, telling them, telling him about their movements. This is exactly, exactly what's kind of going on. They talk about um, fighters who have been killed. Like if there's generals who are killed, they talk about people who've been martyred. They talk about gains and losses over the day, what's happening, mm. tactical stuff. Yeah. And he screenshots this and then posts it out onto his feed because he's one of the key aggregators, so he's got a huge audience. Yeah, yeah. Which is really interesting. Um, this is just some anonymous, either singular person or it could be multiple people running the account. Um, there's a bit of kind of debate about that. Yeah. Um, just 
on the sheer volume that comes out 24 7 like it yeah, always yeah, be yeah. possible to have one person running the whole thing yeah um so yeah Sidorenko is incredible it's really interesting yep um so we kind of have this we have this kind of distributed ontology i guess where you have a totally distributed twitter network where everyone from um the lady who was sacked from trud through to ivan Sidorenko, you've got the map the map creator here you've got users everyone exists in this kind of same flat plane it's not as if that there's that one to many no distribute i mean yeah ivan has a good network of people so it, like he's got a big audience but people still feed back to him he gets things from other people it's he's like, a contributor he's a con yeah exactly he's a 100 percent contributor yeah so if we can you go back to that actually yep if you, you think of it in network terms other nodes there they can be people on the ground yes and they send they transmit to ivan yes and then he publishes out because he's got the big audience. I mean, even a GoPro would fit in this network. Yeah. Someone who has a GoPro on their helmet. Because that's how he gets some yes. stuff as well. Exactly. The phone. Or, or he. Or they. Ivan. It, yeah. Raw data. Um, so this is interesting. This is a video of... Um, this is really interesting, actually. So this is a... Someone put this map together. It's a video that basically is a time lapse of. So you can see up the top left here the date. This pretty much goes through the gains and losses in te in terms of territory um, in Syria over a, about a three a three year period. I would argue. Um, it's fascinating to see this. You can kind of see like this is high level analysis, and this is. This, this piece of content was created, it's important to remember that this bit of content was created by um, compiling all of those maps I showed you before and making them into like one kind of time-lapsed entity, I guess. Yeah, so, so you've got all these people yeah, yeah. just making these maps and then someone else picks up all the maps. Yeah, so this is just a remix. It's just yeah, someone's it's just remixed a remix. all those maps. Yeah. It's straight up, that's all it is. It's yeah. just a remix. Uh, if we can skip through, we can see. You can kind of see how it's starting to go. The tide starts to turn. Yeah. And then, and we're years Palmyra. later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's incredible. That's huge. <laughs> Absolutely ridiculous. And we don't know who. No idea who made that. No. Um, we have a bit of a clue. We'll get to this in a sec. You can see down here where it says Syria General. Yep. I'll um, we'll get to that in a second. So yeah, here we go. Syria General presents. Here we go. <laughs> it's like a sort of a great Hollywood movie, isn't it? <laughs> um, so Syria Syria General presents the Syrian Civil War map sequence covering Friday, twenty second of March, twenty thirteen, to Monday, the twenty seventh of March, twenty seventeen. It's almost four years. Um, you can see down the bottom here. It says this movie was generated by a script written by user at Deep Cover One Thousand. So an online user here has created a script mm. where they've basically gone through one of the map aggregators I showed you before, yeah. and it's compiled probably a screenshot of every single map uploaded into a visual representation into the video. Um, I have no idea who Deep Cover 1000 is. Deep Cover 1000 might not even care about the Syrian Civil War. He might just be, or they might just be great at writing scripts. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. And, like, couldn't tell you. And that's kind of what's really interesting about this is that it's, um, it's I don't know, there's no kind of clear, like, oh, what am I trying to say? There's no kind of clear publisher. It's yeah. just done by someone. Yeah. I think that's, yeah, it's an interesting dynamic. Um, Syria General is also interesting. We're going to get to that in a second. So this is interesting too. Everything's interesting here. This is great. <laughs> so we've got... So we've got, this is on Reddit, so these, these maps don't just exist on Twitter or YouTube in the terms of that video. It's like a transmedia narrative, right? Like, these maps exist everywhere. They're all, all over Reddit, they're on, um, some of them even make it onto Facebook, Twitter, um, other online forums as well. So we have here the title, Syrian Arab Army, fully captured, uh, only 37 kilometers away from Deir Azor, which, is, which was a huge kind of pivotal point in like turning point in the in the conflict. 
So you can see there's 93 comments. And this is interesting here. So where do you get these topographic maps? Ah, that's interesting. So someone kind of wants to know a bit more about it. Hmm. And then user underscore Sakurai says, I use topographicmap.com. So they're kind of, this is like this process of kind of information sharing that goes on all the time. It's not as if the topic that like, it's not as if topographic map guy just makes his map and then like is really kind of protective. It's over. not like his product. No, no, exactly. That he's made. Yes. It, it, yes the, it's like not as if, well, it's like what we were talking about before where, um, the value doesn't come from scarcity. The value comes from attention. So if you like, everyone can do this. Yeah. It's if you create the, the map that is the most aesthetic or the best or like the most up to date, that's when you're going to get mm. kind of audience engagement. It's not just because you're the only one creating maps. Yeah. So yeah, I use topographicmap.com. Uh, and then straight up, unfortunately, the window they embedded the map in is way too small. If you want to see it close to the way I do, you have to play with some of the pages HTML elements. So there's like a bit of kind of, um, I don't know, like some tips on, yeah, how, some to tips and discussion with on how to do it and how to make them look good. Yeah. How to make it work. Yeah. Which is awesome. Yeah. Totally open source. It's happening in public. Anyone can see this. I mean, I didn't even take part in this conversation, but now I'd have a, a reasonable idea of if I was to use topographic map, how to, to kind of go about doing it like this, I guess. But think about the logic of this. You, you're not going to go, oh, well, maybe I need to go and enroll in a HTML course. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Not at all. Not even for a second. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's insane. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's, that's kind of what, what I mean by adaptive content creation. So yeah, like I said before, it's kind of this process of transmedia map making. They appear across multiple platforms. They're open source. Everyone can see the content that goes into making them. Mm. Um, I haven't shown this, but a lot of the time underneath the map, there'll be hundreds of comments where people are saying, what about this? How about this? You didn't. What about this video showing this? And then yeah, yeah, it's like if you go into the comments on Wikipedia. Yes, exactly, and that's like something is interesting that it's like even though the map looks good, it's never like just finished. It's never just done. It's like not as if this was the map for today, and there's no counter narrative that can have yeah. anything to do with changing it. Yeah, people are always going to find different things or have different opinions on why stuff's going on. So it's kind of always in flux. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, different cartographic formats are constantly developed, consistently developed and improved upon. So the key characteristics of this kind of process would be that there's a high rate of ideation. Um, they're highly adaptable. The decision making that goes into making them is highly transparent. It all happens in public. Mm. Uh, it's open source. There's collective intelligence because it's not just one person doing this as like relying on the cognitive input of basically everyone in the network who's engaging with this content. Yeah, that Thousands one person. Yeah, yeah. That one person who pops up and goes, oh, you've got to tinker with the HTML. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, there's quick feedback loops. Like, you'll put something out, and then within minutes, you'll be getting kind of feedback straight away on how to make it better, even if the format of your map's not good, mm. or whether the content in it needs kind of a bit of tweaking. Yeah. There's feedback on everything. Yeah, yeah. Well, like, think about my, my Prezi. Yeah, with yeah. With the typo. Exactly. If I make that open, anyone can just jump in there and fix it up and change it. Yes, exactly. Or if people, if people want to change the background, they can. If yes. they think they can improve the aesthetic, yep. if they want to play with the typography, any of that, yeah. they can do it. It's not like this printed thing no, not where all. there's the, <laughs> the master designer comes yeah, and yeah, crafts yeah, 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 yeah. the final product. <laughs> it's just there and anyone can pick it up and do whatever they want with it. Yep. Yeah, straight up. And this is the same dynamic. And this is what's really important is mapping the dynamics across things. So like you said before, this is how it applies in this yes, particular exactly. situation. Exactly right. But the mechanic works across the internet because the mechanic is part of the logic of the medium. Yes, exactly. That's, that's the logic of the medium. That's mm. so important to remember that. This, would, this, this kind of stuff would apply for anything anywhere online, any type of content, yeah. with any frame, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> here we go. Mm. So, uh -oh. yeah, <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. Um, <laughs> so Syria General, um, as you saw before, was that, um, Syria General, okay, this is gonna take a bit of, need to give you some context here. So Syria General is a, th a thread that appears pretty much daily and has done for 
Oh, I've been following it for about two years now. Mm. It's been there for a long time. I think almost since the start of the war, three to four years. Yeah. Every single day, sometimes two a day, if there's high intensity of stuff going in multiple spots around the country, Yeah. this thread will pop up on 4chan. Um, and it's a thread totally devoted to the Syrian civil war and discussing what's going on there, deconstructing everything, mm. pulling apart content, looking at things. Like, they analyse these maps in, like, minute detail. It's kind of like there's a thousand eyes looking at this content, right? So it's really, it's kind of full on, it's powerful stuff. This is where the kind of the collective intelligence angle comes in, I guess, um, because you have kind of this, like, it's not just one person, it's like thousands of people in the same space looking at things. Yeah, and before before we go on, it's probably important to note, if you see, you've seen 4chan here and go, oh, what's this, this is interesting, <clears throat> and you put it into your browser, yeah. and you have a look, yeah. just be really careful. <laughs> about where you do that where you do that and who you do it around who you do it around because <laughs> the kind of content that can be put on 4chan yes can be pretty wild yeah yeah it's pretty um it's a uh, i mean i'll talk about why it's wild in a second but yeah it is so just keep that in mind yeah if yeah. you're uh, interested in having maybe a if you've got your for example you've got your laptop hooked into a projector in front of a class <laughs> you probably don't want to go to poll you just can't predict what's going to come up no exactly it's not like the New York Times where you're like, oh, it'll be a nice front page and this is kind of, it could be kind It's highly unfiltered. Yes, exactly. No filter at all. Yeah. Barely. So just keep that in mind when mm. you go on there. Yes, yeah, exactly. Um, so Syria General, this is the, the logo of 4chan in the middle with the, the four-leaf clover, the, the clover. Mm -hmm. um, so Syria General is kind of like, there's a, as you would kind of expect with having a... Um, an online space that a lot of people inhabit for years at a time. It kind of gets its own community, and that's why someone made this logo. No idea who it is. Someone who's good at Photoshop. Yeah. Or InDesign, whatever, made this logo. And this is the Syria General logo. Uh, forward slash SG, for short. Um, yeah, you can see it here. So this is like it's transmedia kind of stuff as well. It exists everywhere. It's like permeated onto YouTube as well in the content that gets hosted there. Now this is what uh, one of the the threads looks like. Um, they pretty much have this format. It's actually really interesting how this format evolved. The very early, the really early SG threads were kind of a bit chaotic, um, but then over the course of this thread being posted every day, it's what we're talking about, like iterating on things, right? Like as this thread got posted every day, day after day, they figured out what a good format was to display all the information that was going to be relevant. Yeah. So. I think, yeah, so we have the maps. They're a key section of this. Mm. So there are, so Peter Luchum's in here as well. So every time the thread gets started, you see this now, yeah, this yeah. format. So this is yeah. the format that you see. It gets, it does get kind of tweaked on a little bit every now and then. Yeah, because new stuff happens. Yeah, yeah, and... yeah, exactly. It's not like, it's always that, like I said, it's always in flux. Yeah. But who starts Syria General? Who starts the thread? Couldn't tell you. No idea. Yeah. Anyone. I could start one if I really wanted to. Like, it'd take me a bit of time because I've kind of, um, like you've got to have all the sources at hand to kind of go but mm -hmm. yeah you can start one straight up yeah easily and this is interesting this is from the the Syria General Twitter page actually uh, run by many so this I think this absolutely nails it totally nails this kind of online internet and aesthetic where it's like not just it's not run by not run by Doug over in Wollongong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not even, not even for a second. It's run by, it's run by everyone who takes part in the. Well, in it's the online space. well, it's always changing. Yeah, yeah. So, exactly. it's run by Jim, Jack, Jessica, Bob, whoever, everyone, everyone who contributes. Even if it's only, even if you only put in one one comment or something per thread, you're still helping to run the show. Mm. Um, notable achievements include getting moderate terrorists and ISIS bomb. We'll talk about that later. Um, so it's an anonymous aggregation space, basically. These threads exist, and what happens in them is essentially like a dump of data. That's basically what the start of the thread is, with all of that, like the way this all that formatted with the maps, the kind of the green text where there's like pretty simplified versions of movements, what's going on. It's like a, an absolute data dump, mm. and then underneath that, there's hundreds of comments that happen in each one uh, where they 
sift through this data and they kind of make sense of what's going on. Yeah. Um, it's awesome. And that all happens in real time. So 4chan itself is quite interesting. You have this idea of being anonymous. Um, it's kind of, there's almost total anarchy in there due to the anonymity. Um, <laughs> but it also relies on the cognitive surplus that we spoke about before. Like it's the, the fact that you're not using your free cognitive time just for consumption anymore. It's more directed at yeah. um, production, aggregation or curation and involvement yeah. in, the, in the medium. Um, it's distributed modes of production. They happen all over the place. Content comes from YouTube, Twitter, Reddit, everywhere. And obviously, there's collective intelligence because there's so many people kind of engaged with it. The thousand eyes, I like to call it. Mm. Or Ted actually likes to call it. <laughs> the thousand eyes. So there's no structure. There's no hierarchy. There's total freedom. And at the end of that, that leaves you with these adaptive swarms of information mediators. So the idea of a swarm is really interesting here, I think. Yeah. Because you have, it's like... Think about it like ants. You like put a drop of honey on the ground and then a swarm of ants just go around it mm. and just tear it apart. That's basically what's happening here. You just dump all this data and information and content there and then like thousands of people just kind of look at it, try and pull it apart, try and like kind of get some kind of message out of it and figure yeah. out what's going on, like organize it into some sequential like digestible product. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's like not everyone's going to know everything about everything so everyone kind of has their own little input and that that's really interesting because like that's kind of what helps it helps it work. Yeah, the swarming dynamic is really important. Like we'll talk about this a lot. Yes. Um, next week we can talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. More. Swarms are swarms are the way of the internet. I think. Yeah. They are absolutely. Well, there's no, there's no. Uh, this is the hierarchy thing. Mm. because anyone can just swarm around anything at any time. Mm -hmm. There's no... It's not like in the legacy paradigm where you're kind of cut off from the swarm. You're not allowed to assemble around information and look at it. You're just kind of given to it. You have to passively... Yeah, so stuff interesting happens mm. or there'll be an interesting like information drop. Yep. That's the drop of honey. Yes, yeah, exactly. exactly. And then people just mob around it and yep. start sorting it out. The interesting dynamic here is when wikileaks drop something yeah yeah absolutely and people that's there's so many kind of different interpretations of that yeah and it's like a battle of interpretations people trying to fit like back up get extra information to like back up kind of their their point about it. it's really interesting yeah yeah and they're highly scalable mm. that's what's really important yes exactly they're not it's yeah i'm going to talk about this they're not um they're not necessarily, what's the word I'm looking for? They're not, um, <laughs> I've totally lost it. <laughs> they're not, um, it's Taleb talks about it with Andy Fragility. They're not um, over-optimized. Yes. So yeah. they're, they're quite clunky, I guess. Like there's no, it's not as if. There's a lot of redundancy. Yes. Yeah, exactly. But that kind of is what makes them work so well. Yeah. Yeah. Because people will just come in and there'll be so many people just kind of uselessly working on stuff. Yes. That's a dead end. Yes, exactly. But the point is that they're finding that there's a there's, dead end. Yes, exactly. It's like getting negative feedback, still good feedback. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But when you're a large organization and you're paying all these people, mm. that's really bad because there's <laughs> all these people exactly. who work... Who wasting, were, wasting all your money on like... Yeah. Everything, yeah, 100%, straight up. It's this efficiency, efficiency and redundancy thing. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, so Nassim Taleb very interesting guy actually he talks he talks about this um, so I would argue that these online spaces and this is, these are his words now thrive and grow when exposed to volatility randomness disorder and stresses and they love adventure risk and uncertainty like they thrive on the fact that it's totally unknown what's kind of happening in there mm. um, and yeah. he, he would he would call this basically it's kind of anti-fragility. It's not um, rope. Okay, well, we'll get to that. So fragile is something that's damaged by disorder, often over-optimized. That's what I was talking about. It's like, think about fragility like this. Like if you over-optimize, say you're going on a holiday and you're flying, your holiday's in Paris and you finish work at like 5 p.m. and your flight's at 10 and you like, ev like every single time. So like you go straight from work to the station to catch a train, which then gets you to the airport with one minute to spare to catch your flight. 
what happens when your train's late and then you miss your flight? Yeah. That's like a, an over-optimized system. Like you've got to have buffers in there. So when it works... When it works, it's awesome. It works, it works really with high well. efficiency, yes. low cost, everything. Yep, it's it's all happening. Yeah. But when it doesn't work, when something, when some kind of external factor comes in and inhibits the process that you're trying to be taking part in, that's when um, the over-optimization can negatively affect yeah. affect process. Yeah. Um, Fragile organizations are often large, um, hierarchical and structured. Um, so that's not in my job description. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, I'm not getting paid to do that. Yeah. Why should I? So when something pops up yeah, yeah. that needs to be taken care of. Yes. What do you do? Well, who does it? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and the hierarchical kind of thing, like the, the one to many approach kind of embodies the idea of this hierarchically structured kind of working space, I guess. Mm. And they often rely on external factors to ensure their own survivability. So, I mean, a great example of that is to think about journalism and the advertising that needs to come in to pay for, like, the New York Times to even exist. Yeah. They're relying on the external factors. Like, they don't support themselves under their own weight yeah. of what they're doing, Yeah. which I think is quite fascinating. Um, yeah, so this, for example, straight up, that's highly fragile. <coughs> Mm. Um, robust, which is um, basically something that's resilient to disorder. It's basically flat. It's the embodiment of the status quo. Uh, if something's robust, it's probably it's not going to get better under stress, but it'll it'll be able to handle it. Yeah. Well. So, yeah. Yeah. So, like for example, uh, with the travel analogy, if you leave a little bit of time in between each segment of your journey. Um, it's not going to be super over optimized, but it'll be robust because you've got buffers there. Yeah. But it's yeah, that's. So, it, so it, it, this this is pretty robust, like the the distributed Twitter network, and just the internet as a whole. I mean, if sections of the internet, the whole point of the internet existing is that, um, like kind of in the military context, to put like if major nodes are kind of if, kind of destroyed, then they can still communicate. Yeah. Like others can still talk to each other. Yeah. So you can drag out like huge sections of of the internet and it'll still mostly kind of work for a bit. Um, and then we have anti-fragile, which is really interesting. So anti-fragile is literally the opposite of fragile where rather than being punished by disorder, it, the, it gains from it. Mm. Um, Things that are anti-fragile are often small and agile, and they need to be. They need to be adaptable, um, and they have kind of inbuilt survival mechanisms as well, I guess. Mm. Um, and we'll talk about that in the context of 4chan because I think mapping this to something that's kind of tangible really helps it make sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Taleb uses the example. I think I think he uses the example of the wine glass mm. Mm. when you're shipping a wine glass yes, somewhere. Exactly. So of course the wine glass is fragile. Yes. So you can externally pat it in like yeah. So when you're shipping it, yeah, you can put it in a box and you can pat it with all the styrofoam and yep. bubble wrap and all that stuff, and that's going to make it more robust. Yes. So think of the sticker that you put on that. Yep. So you put on if it's just a wine glass in a box, you put a sticker on it and say, "Please don't drop me." Yes. I'm very fragile. Yes, exactly. And if it gets dropped, it's going to break. Yes, exactly. With something that's robust, you're not going to worry so much about that sticker no. because you've got all those things built in there that yep. says that if it gets dropped, it'll be it'll survive. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. okay. Yeah, exactly. But the the opposite of fragile is not robust; it's anti-fragile. Yes. Exactly. And think of the box that has a sticker on it that says, "Please drop me." Yes. It will make me stronger. Yes, exactly. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, that's. Great way of putting it. So if you think about that in terms of um, in terms of 4chan, then I guess you've got a temporary space that's kind of devoid uh, that avoid formal structures of control. So if you think about those control control structures as being like things that make it a fragile medium, mm. so um, identity is one. Yeah. Um, because when you get the brand, yeah, you yeah. got to protect the brand. Yeah, and like the yeah, so like that goes for the New York Times having their brand, but it also goes for like my personal brand. Yeah, so like I don't want to tie my personal identity to what happens on the internet, like yeah, because that's damaging, right? Like yeah. everyone knows the consequences if you brand yourself and it goes wrong. <laughs> that's terrible. Um, 
So there's no filtering mechanisms there. There, there are moderators on 4chan, yes, but they're pretty lax. They only really um, delete content that clogs the board, I've found. Like, mm. if it's just kind of the same thing being posted by a bot or, like, some annoying user, basically. That's from what I've, from what I've seen in my experience. They don't... They let most things, in fact, pretty much everything go. Yeah. It's literally... The only, the, only, the only input they have is to kind of make sure that it works <laughs> as a space. Yeah. They don't filter content as such. So you, you don't have these kind of filtering mechanisms like you have um, in the legacy media. So I think we've kind of come to a point where there's two polar opposites. We have journalism at one end of the spectrum, and then we have 4chan at the other end of the spectrum. And like, so journalism's highly filtered, mm. high identity, high brand. Yeah, four chans like a total kind of no brand, no filtering, yeah. no identity, no nothing. Yeah, as an open space. Yeah, because think of the social capital around something like the New York Times. Yeah, yeah, exactly, and all the journalists who work there, right? Yeah, absolutely. And think of the capital, the social capital of a user called anonymous. Yeah, yeah, and they're all called anonymous. Everyone, yeah. That's, so yeah, it's very difficult that. for yes. social capital to build up. Yes, exactly. On this platform. Yep, absolutely. There's almost no. No chance for social capital, really. Hmm. Um, so this is interesting. I found this screenshot a few years ago um, in August in 2016. So this user is saying um, they started a cult on K once. It's fun banter, and the magic of it was that ego gets loud of, left out of it since everyone's anonymous. So he goes on to say, the reason that normies ruin shit is they add the stupid ego stroking system of liking or upvoting or reblogging to everything, and that means that a select group of people often control site traffic, which I think that's, like, <laughs> what a crap. That's well, so these, mechanisms, <laughs> these me mechanisms are centralizing features. Yeah, yeah, they are, absolutely. It, it causes social networks to centralize yes. around particular yes, users. exactly. I mean, think about pages on Facebook that have millions and millions and millions of followers as opposed to some that have any they have more social capital than the page with like 10 likes for example mm. the same goes with instagram users followers all that kind of stuff um, whereas here that's totally removed so there's none of that you can't like things you can't like things there's no such thing as passive engagement in that terms like if you want to engage on 4chan you have to comment you can't like something yeah you have to you're forced basically to to say something mm. And, I mean, at the bottom, this is interesting as well. On 4chan, any dumbass can have his day. Like, <laughs> it can be... Anyone doing anything can can do something cool. Yeah. Like, because no one knows. I mean, if they if they do something that taps into what the audience on the, the forum wants, then... So these people, they're all anonymous. Yep. There's no accounts, no post history, none of that stuff. So we don't know what's happening. These could be high school kids. Yes, yes, they could be high school kids. They could be, like, 50-year-old, like... IT people. Ivan could be a high school kid. Yeah, yeah. Ivan could be At home school. going, this is getting out of control. Yeah, yeah. Maybe Ivan's not even in Syria. Imagine that if Ivan wasn't even in Syria. That'd be <laughs> insane. Huge. Yeah, that's totally possible. Yeah. And like something that's interesting is like, uh, I feel like we always come back to this is that, that like, what about, like, how do you know if it's real or authentic or like, what if it's true or what if it's fake? Like, you have no idea anymore. Well, they find like, out. It literally happens because no one tells you that it's real or fake. It happens because this open source kind of data sifting takes place. I yeah, guess. because data will be will be put up by someone, yep. and then whether it's real or fake gets verified. Yes, based by on the rest of the swarm. Yes, because exactly. some people in the swarm see their job as a fact checker. Yes, exactly. Um, so these are some of the. These are some of the, some of the things. That, yeah, this is really interesting. So this is a um, <laughs> this is a this is a comment on one of the so one of these maps made it onto the chans. Um, you can see here they're kind of talking a bit about what's going on. Basically, their ideas on what's supposed to have happened. And then these comments underneath, I think, are really interesting. So you've got fake news, stop spreading false inf information, ISIS didn't surrender in Hummer. Um, and I, I believe some form of validation is in order. <laughs> so straight away, there's like, this has triggered pretty much everyone here that, into thinking that this, this map might not be necessarily quite good. Hmm. It's, there's a, it raises more questions than it answers, I think. 
in this context here. Look at this, like, um, stop spreading false information. Like, that's crazy stuff. Um, the fake news. And I think the, the form of validation, they, they, need, they need more content. Like, they're basically putting the onus back on the creator of this to, to prove why, mm. why they have that. And if they can't, then I guess it will be discarded and removed. Yeah. Not removed from the forum, but, like, removed kind of from the consciousness of the group. Mm. So there's like this quality, this is what I mean, like we're kind of by the quality control stuff. Um, this is the thousand eyes looking at content, disagreeing, agreeing, asking for more information, fact checking each other's work. Yes, yeah, so th this is a conflict scenario. So people can put up mis and disinformation yes. and they do. Yes, exactly. they do. But th there's enough in that swarm to fact check that yes, stuff. Yes, exactly. That's, what the, that's where the collective intelligence angle comes in. Hmm. Um, so Hakim Bey is an interesting guy. So he talks about here, so the temporary autonomous zone, he's talking about everything is in a process of being cleaned up. To preserve its autonomy, the tactical medium wants to remain dirty. It can never let itself be surrounded and cleared by strategy, by ideology. It must stay out ahead, drifting before all possible waves, uncertain even of its own trajectory. And that's um, kind of a really poignant way of summing up. Uh, this kind of online space that happens when there's no control mechanisms, no filtering, no structure of anything yeah, really. uncertain it's, of its own trajectory. It, has, it doesn't know where it's going. Well, this, this, is, this gets back to the, the logic of craft. Yes, yeah, and, true. And the production line. Yep, absolutely. Because you don't really know where it's going and how it's going to turn out. That's spot on. But with the production line, you kind of you know exactly what it's going to look like at the end. Yeah, you've got a news piece. Yeah. Of however many minutes, words and minutes, whatever format. Yep, absolutely. Um, Where this is just rolling, happening. Yes, exactly. And like it's talking about um, the tactical medium remaining dirty. So that kind of that's dirty in the fact that it is messy and there is a lot of chaos going on there. Redundancy. Yeah, exactly. Um, so this, for example, is definitely not a tactical medium. Like, the, the legacy paradigm is kind of the opposite of this, I guess. Um, it's interesting because the stuff that happened on Trud also kind of made it into, into the chans as well, uh, into Syria general, to be precise. Um, so this is interesting. Uh, you can research some of the files that dropped, and there's a link. So this is basically what I mean. This is, this is like the honey drop, essentially, right here. Um, there's a link to some information, a whole heap of stuff, 65 gigabytes worth of data. The cover-up and defamation is currently being planned and executed. Download the files before they get deleted. Send it to local news and demand a response. So this is basically uh, calling the, the swarm into action. This is like, mm. this is the drop of honey kind of getting yeah. the swarm activated to, to pull apart. Yeah. 65 gigabytes of raw, raw data. Mm. Um, And I don't know, it's kind of interesting here, we're kind of talking about the internet being a giant copy machine. If everyone downloads a version of this, if, ever, if there's a thousand users with the 65 gigabyte data drop, it doesn't matter if it gets removed because they still have it, it can just get uploaded again and again and again. Yeah. And that's, yeah, that's kind of that real um, anti-fragility, I guess. So this is interesting as well. Um, you don't really have to read the whole thing, but this is a comment on one of the posts where someone, this is kind of epitomizes the fact that maybe someone's not that interested in what's going on. Maybe they don't really have, they're not like kind of weaponizing their attention in the way that you would necessarily think, but they came across Silkway and um, this person used to work for Silkway and then they come up here with four paragraphs basically talking about some of the crazy stuff that happened when this person worked for the airline. Um, so we've got here, so Silkway, uh, one of the several cargo companies operating from the Soviet states. After the union collapsed, most of the military were without pay, so they ended up just selling off a whole bunch of old equipment, vehicles, planes, weapons, absolutely anything. Um, you can get weapons quite cheap. Um, and they attracted kind of old Soviet pilots to charter the planes out for cheap. Um, and companies like Amnesty International and the UN and the Red Cross were also using these like these Silkway Airline kind of organisations because they were cheap, right? They were, huh. they were cheap. 
Um, they wanted to use the money. They wanted to save money on delivering aid by using like these kind of shonky old Soviet era. Ah, oh, okay, I see. Yeah. So they they paid for these parts to fly these duct tape planes into war zones so the parts made money on the grey cargo, the extra ten or so tons of extra cargo they could put in the plane. Yeah. So pilots, uh, basically you've got this guy saying, well, it could be a lady, I'm not sure, like you've got this person here saying that they, um, they know for a fact that pilots were using the extra, the extra space in cargo to smuggle stuff across borders. Yeah. Into war zones. So the cargo could be guns, ammunition, vehicles, tanks, how do they get away with it? They just hide it. You can hide a utility truck in some of the hidden spaces on these big planes. So you've got the UN and the Red Cross flying stuff into war zones. Yep. And possibly sitting in the crate. Yes. Next to their stuff is weapons. weapons. Yeah, absolutely. That's given to yes. the terrorists. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Because that's the pilots can make money on the side by smuggling stuff in. Um, so, for example, huh. when Starikov crashed en route to Libya in 1996, they found bits of fighter jet amongst the wreckage. So there were jet, there were pieces of jet inside this plane that was supposed to be an aid plane. Crazy. <laughs> Crazy stuff. <laughs> um, but important hubs for this are UAE, uh, Uganda, and Azerbaijan. And then it kind of goes into a <laughs> bit of a black hole. But it, that's interesting. This is this person who's got some like kind of this is this is a really valuable bit of content. Um, it could be totally fake. Yeah, it could it be. Could be completely fake. Yeah, I have no idea. Mm. But based on the other kind of content that we've looked at and the dynamic of what's happening and the research that everyone else has done in the network and the stuff that. Um, the journalist who worked for Trud did it kind of it fits mm. it makes sense yeah um, and that's kind of how that's like kind of this never ending process of kind of fact checking and things are never finished like this story yeah. won't be done someone else might because something see might happen yeah yeah and it, and it could be as weird as someone's watching a piece of footage and identifies a piece of equipment and can somehow map it back to this information yeah yeah so suddenly this story that was that's seemingly dead and buried yes. can just be pulled out yes yeah exactly so again you kind of got this characteristic of reflective intelligence open source highly adaptable totally transparent mm. quick feedback loops yeah and that's that's yeah that's kind of <laughs> So that's what's happening. That's what's happening, yeah. That's unreal. Yeah, I know. It's crazy, isn't it? It's, yeah. Um, really, really quite intense. And and like we were saying, so, so this is Doug's stuff, Doug's working on, and he's focusing on collective intelligence in this kind of combat zone mm. situation. Mm. But it doesn't have to be a conflict. No. No, it can be, you can... Where we see collective intelligence happening. Yeah, yeah, of course. So this is a really, this is a really interesting example. This is in, uh, this is in the readings. The He Will Not Divide Us flag. So, as the title suggests, so Shia LaBeouf. (laughs) Shia LaBeouf hides a flag. He will not divide us. He hides that in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, he does. And users on 4chan see it. Yep. They identify Where it the, is. the location. Yep. Using flight and star patterns. <laughs> oh, that's crazy. So there's a uh, there's a video here. Where we can see. So this, this is the flag that's sitting out there. And people are looking at it. Capture the flag. Yes. So there it is, unknown location. And, like, what can you tell from that? In the sky, really? Yeah. A bit of cloud. Oh, 
So Fortune using flat plants to locate the flag. So here we go. People checking the maps. They're checking the weather. So they're looking at the screens. They're looking at the, the tweets of it out and they're going, okay, well, what's the weather in that location? Yeah. Okay, well, what weather forecasts are there that would map to that? Okay, so we can see some planes in the background. Where are flights at the moment? How does that map to the weather? Yes. And this is just people. This is just people contributing stuff. <laughs> so people watching the live stream. So we have it in a location. the flag. There it is. <laughs> so someone's driving past, putting the pictures up. They're putting them on Twitter, they're putting them on Chans. Yeah, on Reddit. Yeah, it's not platform specific. It's not like there's just one website. And they found the flag. That's incredible. And that's done. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. You mentioned this. Yeah. Yeah, I did mention that actually. So SG, back at it again. Um, this is really interesting because you've got this kind of dynamic here where they're looking at content. It's like a thousand eyes, right? So you can see. Oh, look at that. There's so much going on here. Um, so the story with this was there was a propaganda video put up yep. by ISIS. Yep. And it was at an unknown, unknown location. Yep. It was a training facility. Yep. In the desert somewhere. Yep. In Mosul, I think. In Mosul. Mm. And that video went up. And, oh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> don't know what's going to happen. Ah, yeah. So this here is, it is. This is the classic, yep. So in this one... So um, th this, is the, this is the video that goes up. Yep. And... There's the, supposed to be a ceasefire on. There's supposed to be a ceasefire And on. obviously they're bringing back wounded soldiers so they've broken the ceasefire. Yeah. You could assume. So Ivan puts this up. It, yeah, it, oh, there's Ivan again. Anyone know where this place is? Yep. So people are starting to look at other footage, yep. Google Maps. Yep. People posting stuff. They're getting coordinates. Eventually we find that we've got these things here. What are they? Ah, uh, they're little kind of turret towers. Little turret towers. Or an entrance to this house. We find these on a map somewhere. People put this up. Yeah. We have coordinates. Someone sends it to Ivan. People I are checking it. Yeah. It gets sent to Ivan. Ivan sends it to the, Midius, the Russian Ministry of Defense. And then flattened. And then flattened. Mm. So here it is. Sidorenko shared the coordinates with the Russian Defense Agency's Twitter. So this came through, some of this happened on Telegram. Yeah, it did. It did, actually. Yeah. So it's happening over encrypted channels, open source, like open platforms as well. Yeah. It's happening everywhere. 
This was after the after the Super Bowl. Oh yeah. And there were there were reports coming out of Philadelphia that there was some kind of riot happening yeah. in the streets yeah. afterwards. Yeah. So what have we got here? We've just got we've got video feeds being laid in and people are verifying this story. Yeah. Is this a Twitch stream? This was on YouTube at the time. Okay. But it's got the Twitch aesthetic, doesn't it? Yeah, it like, does. Notice the mess. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah. Absolutely. So we've got police radio yeah. being laid in. We've got this thing from NBC that's coming in there. Yeah. And then we've got some some stream coming through from some Someone. user yeah. on the ground. Yeah. Periscope stream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so, so this shows that we have the legacy media are playing a role in this mm. but they're one of many yes yeah they're not like up here or like, yeah they're not flat. they're not the only ones no. telling this story no exactly this story is happening City, we should have cops all around everywhere, that, that, everywhere. That wall. Yeah. so there's the police scanner some stuff so you can get a sense of what's happening mm. yeah it's really interesting yeah so some of the other stuff that you've been looking at is like uh, the raw footage yeah. Do you have yeah. any of that? Um, yeah. I have a with me on the second video You need to go to the sixty. We need another car to ask for that. Once this flat fills up with officers, where you want it to go? Because you'll notice that a lot of this stuff is just raw information that comes up. It's not particularly filtered. No, not at all. Like that, that map, the Google Maps. Um, just edit out the audio for this, but I'm going to have to leave soon. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so here we have... So what's this? This is uh, some, some GoPros on some tanks. So you've got hours and hours and hours of this raw footage, right? Um, people sticking GoPros straight on top of tanks, just recording it straight up, raw data. Yeah. Um, not really assembled in a way that's designed to tell the story as such. Uh, maybe it's not too it's not too necessary at this point. But then we, sh we showed this last yeah, week, yeah. a version of this last week, yeah, we where you can take this footage yep. and you can put whatever you want yes. yeah, exactly. over it. Yeah, exactly. You can end up with um, you can end up with this actually. So you can go from having this <laughs> to having to having um, to having this. To having like a totally aestheticized kind of dynamic. Yeah. So you can take that footage yeah, you, and you can make whatever you aesthetic can you want with it. You can literally do whatever you want with it. You can you can make like a kind of a compilation of um, war footage, or you can make like best tank excerpts from the Syrian war, or you could make like something like this, where it's like some vaporwave tune over over what's going on in Syria at the moment. It's crazy. Yeah. There's literally li it's limitless. The possibilities are limitless. So we should probably end it there. Yeah, I think that's probably a pretty good note to make. We're getting on time. We are. We are getting on time. Pretty much hit nearly the two hour mark. Yeah. Hour 40. So this is part one. We're mm. going to continue this more next week when we look at meme warfare and collective yeah, intelligence. Yeah, a lot of fun. I'm excited yeah. for that. So what we're seeing now is people taking information about a situation and kind of pulling it apart mm -hmm. and trying to figure out a story. Yep. We can also see this in the creation of propaganda content. Yes. That's put online. Yes, yes, we can. Absolutely. And there's plenty of that to go through as well. Yeah. From all sides, like it was, everyone's taking part in that kind yeah. of process as well. And the very creative process that we might typically think of is for marketing, advertising yeah, agencies, yeah. that sort of stuff. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, we can see this happening online with these dynamics as well. Yes, 
Um, I think next week will be a lot of fun. Yeah. We're going to have some really good case studies to show, to yeah. show as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll be awesome. Yeah. So let's finish it up. Yeah, That's okay. it. Awesome. Thanks. We'll see you online. Yeah, see you online. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> Fuck. Okay. Looks like it. <laughs>